This is Duke University. What does a human rights framework um, help us do when we talk about the changing dynamics of Durham? We chose to frame this around human rights because I think we all felt, the planning committee, at some sort of deep, almost inchoate level, that there's something deeply unfair happening in Durham right now, and we wanted to try to get a handle on it and have more of a discussion about it, and then we wanted to use this idea of human rights to do that. As you all know, I'm sure, um, the change in Durham has been dramatic and very fast. Uh, most of the new apartment buildings um, that have been going up uh, all around town are charging rents far north of $1,000 a month for a studio. And the triangle that's comparative to, comparative, uh, compared to a monthly mortgage of that amount uh, for a starter home. So far, very little has been done, if anything, to include affordable housing in these plans. Uh, meaning that long-time and poor residents are very quickly getting priced out of neighborhoods where they've raised their families, where they were raised as kids. Um, as The Independent recently reported, 35, the 35 condos at, uh, that are going up at Durham Central Park will soon go on the market from the high 200s to north of half a million dollars. Um, and here's what the city attorney said in July when this information was shared with the city council and the mayor raised questions about affordable housing. He said, and I'm quoting from the transcript, my opinion is we don't have the authority to require affordable housing as a condition of zoning. So there's some level of powerlessness on the part of the city in addressing this. So what about the idea of human rights in the context of this very fast and very dramatic gentrification? We're so thrilled that Mel Norton could join us here uh, to talk about her work on this very issue and just give us some some idea of the scope and the specificity of how our community is changing. Good evening. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, thank you for that introduction. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, I had the opportunity to originally give this presentation at the People's Alliance membership meeting in May. and. Um, was really surprised, having no idea how it would go over, surprised at how eager this community is to have this conversation and how, I think, ready people are to figure out what's in their power to do about it. Um, to give you a little bit of background about who I am and what I'm bringing to this, um, I've been obsessed with cities for almost my entire adult life. I took an urban sociology class my second year of college that just kind of changed the lens through which I viewed the world. And I created my own urban studies major focused largely on race and class and power relationships in the city. I moved back to the community that I grew up in in South Florida and had some internships and some odd jobs and jumped headfirst into the affordable housing advocacy movement there at the time. Um, this was the early 2000s the height of the speculative bubble in South Florida. Um, luxury condos were landing like spaceships all along the Florida coast. Um, suburban development was being shoddily planted out on the urban fringe. And people were really suffering um, under their housing burden. People simply couldn't afford to live and live well. So wanting to expand my skill set, I came up to um, UNC at Chapel Hill in 2006. Um, to pursue a degree in city and regional planning with a focus on affordable housing policy, and was almost immediately sucked into Durham. Um, I realized that there is something special about this community, and it's a place that I wanted to learn from, and a place that I wanted to give back to. Um, so I interned with the Durham Community Development Department. I did my master's project on building a neighborhood indicator system so we could better understand how neighborhood change is happening and tailor our policies to effectively um, meet those changes. And I officially moved here in 2008 and got a job with um, Downtown Durham Inc. Um, which was a really interesting opportunity for me to um, have this laser focus on Central Durham for several years. And it gave me a much deeper understanding of the dynamics that were at play 
in our changing central city and also a better understanding of the politics and the political structures that were at work. Um, I then bought a house in 2009 in the Golden Belt neighborhood in Durham, which is about a mile east directly of Major the Bull in downtown. And I've been there ever since. And I've started a family there and now have a two and a half year old. So I provide all this background to say that the issue of gentrification and our changing central city has been something that I've been wrestling with um, on a professional level, on a personal level, and in an interpersonal level with my, with my various communities in Durham. And so uh, I want to be clear that I'm placing myself in the center of this narrative. I'm not on a pedestal talking down to anyone. Um, I'm right in the weeds. I'm wrestling with it with you. And, um, and I think that's important to say because guilt is not productive and that's not what I'm about. So with that said, I'd like to provide a little roadmap of the discussion today. Uh, we're gonna start out talking about what is gentrification? I feel like it's a term that is used in a lot of different ways. And I think it would be helpful for at least all the people in this room to get on the same page. We'll then place gentrification in a historical context as the latest in a legacy of displacements of poor people of color in Durham, and as a direct result of racially discriminatory policy on the federal, state, and local level. We'll then move the timeline up to the past 10 years and talk about uh, what's causing gentrification in our community right now. Where's it happening, how fast, and where's it headed? And then at the end of the tunnel, I promise we are going to talk about you know, what is there to be done um, because that's really, I think, why most of us are here. So what is gentrification? Um, the definition that I find most helpful and that I find is most honest to its roots is gentrification is the process by which higher income people capitalize on decades of disinvestment in the inner city by moving into neighborhoods historically occupied by lower income people and displacing them. And to the extent with which race and class are often closely aligned, that's largely white people moving into lower income black neighborhoods and displacing them. Um, I believe that gentrification is fundamentally different than revitalization. While revitalization is a ground up process that benefits most, if not all, the members of a community, in the process of gentrification there are definite winners and definite losers. And, and so I would argue that it's fundamentally a social justice issue. So since gentrification is primarily about displacement, I think it's helpful to distinguish between two different types of displacement. I think the one that we think about the most is direct displacement. Um, prices go up, rents go up, and people are forced to leave. Um, I think something that is um, equally at play in our community is indirect displacement, or, or what's sometimes called exclusionary displacement. And that's the processes by which um, longtime residents start to lose their social networks, they don't feel welcome or at home with a lot of the new residents moving in. And there may be some social tensions. Um, there is an inability to participate in the new goods, goods and services coming in to serve new residents. So they can't necessarily afford that $5 specialty coffee drink or that $6 craft brew. Um, and these things over time, compounded over time, lead to um, people choosing to leave on their own because their community does not feel like their community anymore. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because we're gonna return to that um, point when we talk about solutions. So uh, next we're going to place gentrification in a historical context. And while we could start that conversation with the story of colonialism, um, with the white European settlers coming to North America, um, I think it's helpful to start it in the mid 20th century, um, specifically with um, redlining and urban renewal. So I hope everybody can see this map. This was a map created by the Durham Public Works Department in 1937, and it shows the areas in Durham that were originally settled and occupied by black residents. And I'll just walk you through them because they're gonna come back multiple times throughout this discussion. You have Hickstown up in the corner there, which is where Crest Street was, um, and is now um, very close to where the Duke Hospital complex is. You have the Walltown neighborhood, which is just north of Durham's East Campus. You have the West End neighborhood, uh, which is very close to where we are now, um, just west of 
are just east of Duke's main campus on West Chapel Hill Street. Um, and then you have this very large area down here, which is called the Haytai. Uh, you have then large sections of what we now refer to as Northeast Central Durham um, and Old North Durham over on the east side of town. And for those of you who aren't familiar, urban renewal was a policy that came out of the Housing Act of 1949, which was a bundle of policies that basically dictated all of our housing policies for the next 15 year, 50 years. Um, one piece of that was what was called urban renewal, or as uh, James Baldwin famously dubbed it, Negro removal. Um, how it worked is the federal government gave large sums of money to local governments with very little strings attached. The money was to be used for what they called slum clearance, and slums were very, very vaguely defined. And so in city after city across the country, um, those areas tend to be poor black areas. Um, and in Durham, the primary casualty was the Haytai area. And here you can see a aerial photograph of the Haytai um, taken before urban renewal um, and just to get you oriented, you have South Roxboro here on the west end, um, Fayetteville Street on the east side, and just noticed how dense the housing network is and how there's this very fine-grained street network. And now you can see an aerial photograph after urban renewal, and you can see that that whole entire area was quite literally wiped off the map and replaced by this very suburban, low-density style development. And so I think we can ask, where did those people go? I think that many of them went into um, public housing projects, which was also a part of the Housing Act of 1949, and which by this time was a program almost exclusively for blacks. Many of them moved into adjacent neighborhoods of color and gradually expanded those boundaries in the central city. Where they did not go was the suburbs. And um, that was by design. We'll talk a little bit more about that with redlining. Um, redlining started in the 1930s when the federal government started to get into the mortgage business. And what they did is they sent out federal employees to every city across the country. And they raided neighborhoods and areas of the city according to levels of risk for lending. And it was a color-coded system where the least risk was uh, given a green rating, and the higher levels of risk were given a red rating, and a red circle was drawn around them, hence the term redlining. And this is really significant because in the subsequent decades, the finance industry as a whole adopted these guidelines. The Federal Housing Administration adopted these guidelines, the Veterans Administration, Basically, everybody who is in the business of giving mortgages adopted these discriminatory lending practices. And you can see here, um, this is actually the original redlining map for Durham. And you can see that these red areas correspond exactly to the parts of town where black folks lived. And one thing that I want to make very clear is that this was not simply a limited event in history. Um, this was a map done by Tim Stallman for a group called Spirit House in Durham. And what he did is he took outlines of the original redlined areas and he overlaid them onto homeownership patterns for black folks in Durham in 2012. And those homeownership rates were somewhere in the ballpark of 0 to 30%. So what we see is that in this country, gentrification, or in this country, homeownership is the primary wealth building mechanism for individuals and families. And we had two generations of people of color in this country that were largely excluded from that opportunity to build wealth. In the decades following urban renewal, we also see other types of discrimination and the cycle of disinvestment. So you would see less businesses and amenities, which led to less investment and maintenance and services, which then led to deterioration of neighborhood quality of life, infrastructure, safety, schools, public spaces, which then led to fewer residents, decline in housing stock, and more vacant properties. And this cycled for decades. 
And I believe that this chronic disinvestment in urban neighborhoods led over time to other types of discrimination. Um, for example, I'm very hard pressed to believe that we would be seeing the types of dynamics with the war on drugs and policing if we didn't have chronic racial residential segregation. Same thing with disparities in schools and disparities in educational attainment. Same with disparities in health outcomes. Same with chronic environmental racism in low-income communities. And just to be clear, that none of these things are the fault of these low-income residents in these neighborhoods. But it's the direct result of decades of racially discriminatory bad policy and structural disinvestment. So, let's move the timeline up to the past 10 years and let's get into the weeds a little bit about what's going on in Durham right now. But before we do that, um, this slide didn't quite fit well anywhere in the presentation, but I think it's really important. So we're going to talk about it for a second. Um, in a classic text on gentrification, the sociologist Neil Smith spent the entire first chapter talking about the language and the imagery of gentrification. And he noted that that language and, imag and imagery is the frontier mythology. So you hear about urban pioneers moving into the central city. You hear about trailblazers. You hear about up and coming areas. And sometimes I've even heard it referred to as the wild, wild west. Um, and this is not, um, this, this language is very, very common. It was in The Independent this week. You know, one of our liberal um, progressive papers was talking about some new development on East Main Street and how these trailblazers are coming in to fix up this area in East Main Street. And I think that this is really dangerous language. I think it erases the collective history of all of these areas and what's come before it. It places a very uncomfortable status for me on, on the white gentrifiers coming in as these kind of like, you know, roll up your sleeves, do it yourself, fix up your house, you know, this real pioneer embodiment. And I would be really happy if we could start to eliminate the use of this language in our community. I'm writing a letter to the Indy tomorrow. <laughs> What's causing gentrification? Number one, disinvestment and structural racism. Um, this is the foundation of gentrification. Um, decades of disinvestment in the central city has created extremely undervalued real estate in our central city. Number two is downtown revitalization. Um, what's happened in downtown over the past 10 years is really nothing less than extraordinary. While I was working at DDI, there was 400, small 400 plus small businesses that opened on the street level in the five years that I was there. It's brought a lot of buzz, it's brought a lot of excitement, um, and it's put a huge geographic proximity, a huge premium on geographic proximity to downtown. And I think it's important to underscore that this didn't just happen. <laughs> there was sustained ongoing advocacy. There was substantial private investment, substantial public investment through public-private partnerships or what people commonly refer to as incentives. And here's just a snapshot of how it's changed. Since 1993, we've gone from 3,800 residents in downtown to over 16,000. We've gone from 112 residential units to uh, 1,350, most of those in the past three years. We've gone from 1.1 million visitors to 2.3 million visitors. And we've gone from less than a million square foot of retail space at less than 70% occupancy to three plus million square feet of office space at 93% occupancy. It is kind of back and forth between downtown Raleigh and downtown Durham, the most successful um, commercial real estate market in the region. And that's all led to um, over $1.2 billion of investment just in the past 10 years. And I can assure you that that is a conservative number. So let's talk a little bit about how the economy is changing in downtown. Um, in 1993, most of the people who worked downtown were uh, city and county employees. And you have the loop that was designed to get people in and out as fast as possible. Um, what we're seeing now is this influx of what are called creative class workers, 
which is a term that the sociologist Richard Florida coined in the early 2000s to describe the workers and the work that are driving the successful, that are driving the economies of successful cities and regions across the country. And what do these creatives want? I mean, they're largely well-educated, um, a little bit on the younger side. Um, some people might call them hipsters. Um, they work in the tech industry, they work in startups, they work in advertising, they work in anything that's in the realm of ideas. And they're part of this large sociological shift where they're reacting to the suburbia in which they grew up in. So they're reacting to the homogeneity, the predictability, the boringness of suburbia. And what do they want? They want historic houses, the cheaper the better, to be close to downtown and urban amenities, and they value diversity. And I put diversity in scare quotes because I think that there are some tensions and contradictions in what that value means um, as it plays out in all of our lives. Something else that's playing a role is historic preservation. Um, Durham, like many cities across the country, does not have a stellar track record of historic preservation. I think that we've lost tremendous resources, physical resources and cultural resources. Um, I mean, you can see what happened to Haiti, um, and that's just the beginning. But I think that we're seeing a real sea change in our urban neighborhoods in particular. And that's fueled by a lot of things. It's fueled by changes in taste and preferences. It's also fueled by the availability of historic tax credits. Um, to be eligible for historic tax credits, you have to be in a federally recognized historic district. And what that does is say you buy a house for $30,000 and you put $90,000 of improvements into it, you're eligible to get a third of that back in tax credits over five years, so that's $30,000. That's a lot of money. Um, I have utilized historic tax credits. It is what enabled me to step back from full-time work when my, my first child was born. I feel grateful for it. I also recognize that it's playing a huge role in um, kind of the ravenous appetite for historic properties right now. And just to give you a sense of where these federally recognized historic districts are, it includes Watts Hillendale, Old West Durham, Birch Avenue, um, Old North Durham, Duke Park, Moorhead Hills, Forest Hills, um, Trinity Park, Old East Durham, you know, Cleveland Holloway, um, most of the central Durham neighborhoods. There's also a very prominent role being played by investors. And there's a range of investors um, at work in our neighborhoods right now. Some of them are just kind of people who, they had the experience of fixing up a house, they realize how to do, they, they've gained some skills about how to do it, and they just pick up, you know, a little duplex up the street. There's some people who actually form local companies that make a business of flipping houses. And then on the far end of the spectrum, you have um, global hedge funds and investment firms who've realized that they can get a better return on their investment in healthy local real estate markets than they can in the stock markets. So they put together these large portfolios that they can pay cash, and they just see you know, what's not performing, and then they fire sell those properties. So there is a ton of investment activity in Durham right now, and that's largely because we are the triangle, one of the fastest growing regions in the country, and depending on who's measuring it, we are the fastest growing region in the country. In 2010, there was about 1.5 million people in the region, and by 2035, there's gonna be an additional million people moving to the area. And we are already seeing the effects of this. There is a housing supply shortage. Um, I talked to some real estate folks that I know, and there's like, there's like, yeah, there's five, six, seven, eight people looking for a house for every house that's on the market. And this sh supply shortage is also serving to drive up prices all across Durham. So I just said a lot. Um, I think we're gonna take a little break. What I would like is if people could get into groups of like four or five and just talk about where you live in Durham, um, why you made the time to come out tonight, and what you hope to come away with by the end of this presentation. So we'll give you a good 10 minutes and then we'll come check back in.
as I talk to people in the community about gentrification, which I do seemingly all the time, um, I get so many stories. And I was just talking to Rodrigo about like, how can we start to collect these stories? Shock at a recent sales price in their neighborhood. Um, anxiety about all the high-end real estate coming to downtown. And so I thought it would be helpful to pair those narratives with some data in order to help elevate this to a policy issue because that's, that's the language that policymakers talk. So what I did is I pulled all the discrete sales in central Durham over the past 10 years. So if a, if a house sold four times, we'd actually count each time the house sold. Um, we then organized it by neighborhood and standardized the data by converting it to price per square foot. So we were able to see how prices changed annually on average over time. And since my time was somewhat limited and it was a fairly labor intensive process, we decided to pick six main neighborhoods, um, Walltown, Old North Durham, Cleveland Holloway, Birch Avenue, the West End, and Old East Durham. And I picked those neighborhoods specifically because they all met the criteria in my gentrification checklist. They were all historically black neighborhoods with undervalued real estate, close to jobs and amenities. They were in a historic district, so they were eligible for historic tax credits. And they were convenient to commuter routes. So we're going to start with the Walltown neighborhood. And I'll talk a little bit more about what you're looking at on this slide, and then we can move faster through the other ones. So the average price per square, per, per square foot in 2005 was $71. And in 2015, it was $154. So if you were to just assume that the average house size is 1,500 square feet, the price would have gone from $107,000 to $230,000 in 10 years. That's an increase of 115%, which means that prices have more than doubled in 10 years. And Walltown's an interesting neighborhood because self-help was really, and, and Duke were really involved in the kind of mid 2000s to um, do a substantial um, revitalization project. And they renovated and or built 77 new homes in Walltown, which completely changed um, the look, feel, and dynamics of Walltown. And I think it was, by and large, really good work. Um, one thing that's come up is that none of those homes are permanently affordable. So as they trickle back into the free market over the next several years, um, there's nothing left to keep any sort of economic integration in that neighborhood. Something else that I've heard from people in Walltown is that there's a lot of people reconfiguring duplexes into single family homes, and also just doing these very um, cheap but significant repairs where they like pull up old carpet, shine up the wood floors, and then are able to command significantly higher rents. So I think that um, from what I've heard, that's, those are both really big problems in Walltown. The next neighborhood we're looking at is Old North Durham. And for those of you who aren't super familiar with Durham geography, it's the area just north of downtown, just north of Gear Street, going from approximately Duke Street down to Alston Avenue. So it's really wide um, geographically from east to west. And it's gone from $76 per square foot to 160. That's an increase of 110% in 10 years. And this, just to give you guys some sense of perspective. The 2015 data is only through the first quarter, so I expect that actually all of these numbers will be higher. Um, and no homes in Old North Durham that I'm aware of are permanently affordable. What do you mean when you say no homes are affordable? We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, most affordable housing, if it's done through um, some sort of mechanism that receives federal or state funding has to have an affordability period. So that may be 10 years, it may be 15 years, but after that, there's, you know, it just goes into the free market. So that's how most affordable housing programs work. So here we have Cleveland Holloway. Um, Cleveland Holloway is the neighborhood just east of Roxborough, just north of the downtown library. 
And it's one of the most um, dramatic examples of what's happened, um, both because of how low it was and how high it is. Um, it went from $27 per square foot in 2005 up to $158 in 2015. So it's gone up almost 500%. I'm sure it's reached 500% by now. And most of that has happened actually in like three years. So it happened really, really fast. Some factors that were in play in Cleveland Holloway is uh, there was a lot of investor activity, a lot. There was a lot of flipping. There was also um, the houses in Cleveland Holloway since when it was first built, it was built by white folks. So some of the houses are a little bit bigger, have some nicer architectural features or more appealing in a lot of ways to renovate. And um, a, lot of vacant, a lot of vacant property, a lot of vacant buildings. So all of those factors, I think, really played out in Cleveland Holloway in the ways that you're seeing. And no permanent affordability. So now let's talk about Birch Avenue, which is right down the street from where we are. Um, it's located just north of West Chapel Hill Street, just west, or just north of West Chapel Hill Street, just west of Buchanan. And went from $55 per square foot up to 144. That's an increase of 160% in 10 years. And you see this really dramatic jump in 2012. And although I don't know for sure what happened, it was federally re recognized as a federal historic district in 2011. So I suspect that once tax credits were available, it was that kind of extra incentive to, uh, for investors to come in. What is interesting is that we're starting to get into the land trust territory. So 15% of the homes in Birch Avenue are permanently affordable. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Just south of Birch Avenue, you have the West End neighborhood. This is the area just south of West Chapel Hill Street. And it went from $62 per square foot to 131, an increase of 112%. But you notice that the curve here is a little bit flatter. You don't see any major spikes. It's kind of gone up a little bit more slowly and steadily. And I believe that that's due to the fact that both Habitat for Humanity and the Durham Community Land Trust have spent a lot of time and focus on that area. 25% of the homes are permanently affordable in the West End. Um, so I think that although you walk through the West End right now and like, Buildings are being torn down and renovated all over the place. 25% of the homes are permanently affordable, which you actually don't see anywhere else um, in central Durham neighborhood. From here, we're going to move on to East Durham, Old East Durham. And this is the area, I don't know how many people here are familiar with the Anger Driver Corridor. It's the neighborhood that's kind of around that area, um, south on Angier up to uh, Liberty Holloway Street. Um, and this was a really interesting neighborhood. Um, this is very close to where I live. Um, you certainly don't see the same level of price escalation. And I think that there's a couple important things that I learned about this neighborhood. The first is that um, Northeast Central Durham got pummeled by foreclosures, just devastated. Um, as I pulled the data, I just would see like, like half the houses on some blocks were foreclosed. Some of them were foreclosed multiple times. And so I think that that is, you know, in the foreclosure crisis in, 19, in 2008, 2009, you actually see a little bit of a dip as the banks were like, I just want to get rid of this property. However, at the time that I was pulling these numbers, there was three houses for sale at over $200,000. Um, I recently heard that there's a couple blocks um, on Driver that have basically sold up in the past three months. Um, things are happening really fast. All of these neighborhoods that we're talking about today got hit harder by foreclosures than a lot of other parts of the city. Old, old Northeast Central Durham just got slammed. And I think it's taking a while to recover from that. I also think that if we are to be strategic about where to put in resources about land banking and bringing in community partners, this is the place to do it right now. Can you say that's that is data from the first quarter of this year? Yeah. It goes, yeah, through the first quarter of 2015. It's going to be dramatically different. It is. And if anyone wants to help me pull that data, let me know. 
So it's happening, it's happening fast, it's headed east. I think that's kind of how we summarize um, what's going on. Um, this is a really interesting map that a friend of mine did, Tim Stallman. And it, what it does is it uses home homeowner disclo disclosure data. And that data actually identifies the primary race and the income of each individual homeowner. So everybody who buys a home, those things are recorded and it's actually accessible. And so what he did is he used that data looking at the demographic characteristics of new buyers over the course of 2012 and 2013. And he, he overlaid that, contrasted that with the, um, the demographic information from the census um, from 2010 and then the American Community Survey in 2012. So what you see here is the pink areas, I know it's probably hard to read, are areas in town where just in the course of 2012 to 2013, they were 10 to 70% more white. The lighter pink colors were up to 10% more white. And the green is 0 to 2% more people of color, and the darker green is 2 to 11% more people of color. And so while I think it's hard to draw um, you know, certain conclusions, I think what this does show is how gentrification is actually reordering the demographics of our entire city. Um, so you see how much more white this area is becoming. Um, also South Durham and uh, people of color are moving towards the, the urban edges on the east and on the north. And I have that map hung up somewhere if you want to take a closer look at it afterwards. So, I was not able to do the same type of analysis with rental data because rental data is almost impossible to come by. There's no reporting requirements for landlords and they are very reluctant to share that data. What I can say is that the loss of affordable rentals is one of the primary concerns of gentrification. I think all the neighborhoods that we've been talking about have been the parts of the city that have the most affordable rentals, and nothing is coming along to replace them. And I think that this should be a very, very serious political issue. Um, at the same time, wages are relatively flat. So you see housing prices doubling and sometimes quadrupling, and you know the minimum wage hasn't been raised in, what, six years? So uh, this is a serious issue. So we're here, the three big things, control of land, financing and staff, both on the public sector and in the private sector, and then sustained community advocacy and organizing, both within the white gentrifying community and with the residents who are primarily impacted by this, the lower income residents of color. And this is, once again, this is like a whole graduate seminar, but these I think are the, the three main pieces. Also, it's really awesome that Steve Schul is coming because he has created over this past year, City Councilman Steve Schul, an amazing, I mean, I just like knocked me over. It's like he just laid it out. He's gone to every single meeting. He has wrestled with this issue. And I think he's put together a brilliant strategy, comprehensive strategy. But we'll just talk about a few things. Um, First of all, I think one of our primary assets in Durham is that there's a lot of publicly owned land in the central city. Land owned by the city, land owned by the county, land owned by the Durham Housing Authority. And um, I think that we need to advocate as a community that this land be dedicated to the use of affordable housing. Um, there was an amazing project done by some UNC um, planning students where they looked at the entire transit corridor and identified all of the publicly owned parcels within a half mile of those sites and ranked them according to viability for housing development. So I feel like we actually have a great resource already in our hands. Um, and then there was a group that came together in 2014, the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. This group was largely comprised of members of Durham CAN, Durham Congregations and Neighborhoods in Action, um, the People's Alliance, 
and some long-term um, affordable housing providers in the city. And they were able to get the city to pass a resolution that 15% of housing within a half mile of transit stations be affordable to people making 60% or lower of the area median income. Um, that's a goal, that's not a policy, so we have to hold their feet to the fire. And the first instance of this kind of um, fight for publicly owned land for affordable housing is coming up right now. There's a piece of land, um, if folks are familiar with where the, the um, Durham bus station is, there's a, there's a piece of land that's it kind of sits up high, right adjacent to it on the corner of Jackson and Willard, and there is a proposal by self-help to do 60 to 80 units of affordable housing on that site. It's right next, right next to transit. It rates 100% on the low-income housing tax credit scorecard. And the question is, is the city going to allow this to be all affordable housing, or are they gonna want to create a mix of market rate housing where affordable housing is just a certain percentage of it? Um, and I think that's something that's really rings true to me about these sites is that I think our goal should be creating mixed income communities, not necessarily every single building being a mixed income project. And I think that our city council members need to hear that. Um, and this is probably as good a time as any to mention that there's a city council election coming up. <laughs> I am working on a campaign. Um, I think that this is a really significant election. I think that there's the potential to move this council in a way that they will aggressively um, tackle affordable housing issues in our community. And while I won't endorse anyone specifically, I would point you to um, the People's Alliance endorsement slate and or the Indy, they're the same. And please, please, please get out and vote. So let's talk about the land trust. Are folks here familiar with the land trust model? A little bit, okay. The Durham Community Land Trust was formed in 1987. It's one of the oldest urban land trusts in the country. We are very lucky to have it here. It's a model, it like comes up in the literature um, all across the country. Um, they currently have over 200 units in their portfolio, both home ownership and rental units. And they do, because they've had this very specific geographic focus over the past 30 years, they've been able to partner with a lot of other community initiatives. So they've co-developed a neighborhood center, They've ins helped install bus shelters. They helped address drainage issues. They've advocated to improve street lighting. They've organized community cleanups. This is what neighborhood revitalization looks like. I think we have a really good model here, and we don't have a lot of other community development corporations in the city. Um, so how does their model work? With the land trust model, the land trust acquires, let's say the land trust acquires a property, they own the land and they are able to sell and or rent the building on top of that land at an affordable rate. And if you're a homeowner, you enter into what's called a limited equity agreement. So say you're in a home for 10 years, you get everything that you've paid off on the mortgage back when you sell it, plus some portion of the equity. And then the land trust has the first right of refusal, so it goes back into the pot and it's affordable for the next um, homeowner that comes along. Does that make sense? It's awesome. What I love about the land trust and why it's so powerful to me is that it, to me it represents this fundamental shift in housing as simply an individual community, I mean, so it's simply as an individual wealth building mechanism to a community value and a community resource. So it builds wealth if you're in a homeownership situation, but not at the extent of community. So for example, the average sales price in Birch Avenue in 2014 was $273,000. This land trust home sold for 120. And this land trust home, this is the third time it's been sold in 18 years. So three people have, have come to benefit from this home and start to 
to build wealth and move, are able to move on to the next opportunity in their life. My dream is that we figure out ways to raise capacity for the Durham Community Land Trust and that we have the biggest, baddest ass land trust in the country. <laughs> and I think they should go to Northeast Central Durham next. Um, <coughs> it's interesting, one thing that's come up recently is uh, I was talking to somebody and he's like, you guys, you know, some, you guys, somebody should start a community investment firm in Durham whereby people who may have some money, you know, that maybe they don't have $20,000 to invest, but increments of $1,000, $2,000, go into a community investment fund that has a community um, agenda. They get some small return on their investment, and they can also feel good about the fact that they're creating new long-term affordable housing opportunities in their community. So another idea that, um, that has come up in community conversations is an idea to, to create and implement racial equity assessments in our governance in Durham. Um, this is something that's pretty new. Uh, it started to get a foothold in the UK and there's a small but really fascinating handful of examples of how it's being used um, across the United States. Um, one that comes to mind is the Milwaukee School Board has been doing amazing things with this. And so this would demand that all new municipal policies and budgets undergo a racial equity assessment. Since so much of our policies historically have been explicitly racial, I think that it's not helpful to have a colorblind um, attitude towards our policies. And I feel like we should at least adopt the policy of do no harm. Um, I feel like it would also would be really helpful for decision makers to better understand how their decisions are affecting these divides in our community. Um, and so I think it would, would shift this kind of diversity value into you know, really valuing equity in our decision making and in our communities. And I'm excited about what this could mean. Um, this is kind of a seedling idea. Um, and so the last section here, let me check on time, we're going to be talking a little bit about kind of this indirect displacement. And this is me as a white progressive speaking to largely an audience of, of white liberals and progressives about what our responsibility is to foster inclusive neighborhoods and develop an anti-racist neighborhood agenda. And I'm going to start by talking about neighborhood listservs. <laughs> One thing that I didn't mention is that I spent probably seven years on over a dozen neighborhood listservs. And if I ever read a book, <laughs> I'm going to write a book about it. <laughs> because it's fascinating and also sometimes shockingly and embarrassingly um, embarrassing instances of racial profiling, um, especially in gentrifying neighborhoods. And I think it would be really powerful if you know, we had a, an ally that we could work with in our neighborhood to start to create user guidelines for how these forums can and should be used. Um, one idea is to create or to appoint a moderator, ideally somebody who's gone through racial equity training, um, because some of these Racial profiling instances are very coded, and some of them are just, um, just very blatant. I think that we also have a huge responsibility, especially those of us who have moved into low-income, traditional low-income neighborhoods of color, to create more inclusive spaces within our neighborhood. What I observe so often is there's these kind of two layers of community happening in these neighborhoods. Um, and I think a big part of that is taking these dialogues offline. And what, what, what does that mean? What, what does that look like? I think it means advertising meetings outside of an electronic forum, um, knocking doors, having food, um, creating print newsletters, and then creating opportunities for neighbors to interact and get to know each other where it's not neighborhood business where there's not a hard agenda. Um, 
I think this is really important. Why those are important? Can I repeat that? Can you be explicit? Can you be explicit about why those are important? I think that this is really important because what I've noticed is that higher income, largely white people, moving into lower income, largely people of color neighborhoods, these people are bringing a different set of values and a different set of norms to what their expectations are about what goes on in their neighborhood. I, I see this come up a lot around noise. I see it come up a lot around um, how people use public spaces. And I think in order to break down and challenge some of those norms, I think that there has to be face-to-face -face interactions. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So another thing that has been a big part of Durham culture in the central city over the last several years is neighborhood home tours. Um, you know, neighborhoods put together um, a showcase of homes that have been you know, beautifully renovated and people have done a lot of work and are rightfully proud in a lot of ways of the work that they've been done. And um, what troubles me about neighborhood home tours is I feel like a lot of times they become kind of a showcase of gentrification. They tend to be almost exclusively white. And, um, and I wish that there was a way to harness the energy and a lot of times the financial resources that come out of those home tours um, to bring some sort of broader community benefit. I mean, that could be creating an emergency rental or repair fund. That could be donating to the land trust. You know, it can be a number of different things. Um, but I would love to see that, that practice in Durham kind of um, worked on a little bit in terms of its equity, um, its equity perspective. I think another big part of moving into a neighborhood as a, as a white person of relatively larger means is we have a fundamentally different relationship to the police. And I think it is one of, um, one of our key responsibilities if you choose to move into these neighborhoods to, uh, to really question and wrestle with yourself on when you call the police. And everybody's gonna set a different boundary around that. Um, my partner and I, like our, our boundary is if we hear gunshots, we'll call because maybe somebody needs first responders. But um, just calling the police for noise, calling the police for a dog that's changed, I mean, I feel like there's just so much that people can and should handle face to face that recognizing, particularly in this moment where there's so much um, kind of consciousness around the challenges that police play in low-income communities of color, I think we need to be very careful about that and just, and just wrestle with yourself about it. And a good way to wrestle with yourself about it is to take a racial equity workshop. Um, I think a lot of people, do, do you all have those gentrification resource handouts? Um, there's two institutions on there that do amazing, amazing racial equity training. Um, one of them is DR Works, and the other one is the Racial Equity Institute. They both have trainings coming up in Durham. Um, I wish that it could be a requirement that if you are a white person moving into a neighborhood of color, you, that you take one. I feel like I've taken like six, and every time, like it, it, it just changes, it changes my perspective and... It's so valuable. I mean, I can't even express how valuable it is. It's, it's changed my worldview. And the, we're lucky enough to have people who are really good at it here. And the last one I want to talk about is committing to public schools. Um, something in the gentrification literature nationwide, you see certain things pretty reliably. Property values go up, crime goes down, schools don't change. And, and I have a kid, I have a two and a half year old, 
and we're already starting to have that conversation in our house and in our, and with our neighbors about what that means. But I think if you choose to live and buy a home in a community, I think you should start thinking very seriously about being in a community in a holistic way, and that includes schools. Because um, our schools are under attack. So, looking forward, what does revitalization without displacement look like? How do we influence the conversations around the use of public resources in our community and make racial equity a guideline for public policy and development? How do we raise the comfort level in our community to talk about race and address our own exclusionary actions? Um, these are really big questions. Um, I hope I've given you some things to think about. One thing I would like to direct you to is there is currently um, a citywide book study that was initiated by an amazing group in Durham called Spirit House. It's a woman of color led collective that does, they did a citywide book study on the new Jim Crow, talking about the war on drugs in this community. They're doing this urban alchemy study. They do deep, powerful work around restorative justice. Um, and they'll be leading a, another community dialogue on this book on November 7th. November 7th. And I would love, 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 love if every single person in this room goes to the Spirit House website tonight and donates a little something. Even if it's $10, $20, I feel like there are community organizations led by people of color that are doing the front lines work. Um, and they're constantly under-resourced. And I would love if they could get a little bump um, after the discussion tonight. So in summary, I feel like I'm not cynical about the future. I feel like ultimately what it comes down to is having lots and lots and lots of conversations across Durham about what we value, who we value, and what actions we are willing to take to make those values a political and a, and a community priority. Um, so that's, what's I, that's what I got for you. What's happening now with the light rail uh, initiative? I saw you had a slide up earlier that showed where that was going. I know a friend had written a grant for federal funding for revitalization of neighborhoods along the right light rail line, and then I heard it got caught or cut or omitted through the last funding cycle of our legislature. Okay. They, they, and somebody here, I, back there, you can probably answer that question. Uh, did get $1.7 million uh, from federal government to do planning of the light rail stations. And their application did have a large component looking at affordable housing and doing some of the same sort of analysis and tracking over time that the UNC students did. Uh, the state, uh, so completely separate pot of money, uh, the state had allocated uh, $138 million for the right-of-way construction, et cetera. That was the part that got limited to $500,000 in the budget bill and which now still stands. So, so as of now, uh, you know, legislatures adjourned. They weren't able to get that removed. Uh, so that restriction is on there. Um, what that means, uh, don't, don't really know. Um, that'll be a, a job for future legislation. Uh, and then the big piece, of course, would be whether the federal government would kick in the share that's needed and we wouldn't know that for probably another three years. That's when the final engineering and the application would go. So it's, so it's very much up in the air. The planning money is still there and should move forward. Um, the, the, the pot of state money for construction is now uh, in limbo. Um, so it's not really 500,000 you can't limbo waiting to see. Well, no, the, I mean, the budget says you can't spend more than 500,000 on light rail. Um, the, 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 I won't get too down in the weeds, but the, the state uh, uh, transportation program has that $138 million still in it. So it would have to get taken out of that to, to really disappear. Um, so who knows? Right, but the Senate, Senate didn't, right. 
I'm James Mumford. I am president of Kinston, Lenore County, NAACP. I drove two hours to be here, got lost, turned around, back and forth. Uh, but I made it. Uh, my question is one that um, speaks to how can we get this conversation in Kinston, uh, which is encompassed around Lenore County, where we have gentrification. Uh, many of the, the community there is, uh, within the city is predominantly African American and don't really understand the dynamics of gentrification. We see it uh, as far as Heritage Street in Kinston, which is a prominent street, Mitchelltown, which is a historic district. Uh, with them wanting to create bike trails and, you know, the housing is paint certain colors and it's just this, you know, and you see kind of like, uh, besides bad landlords, you see kind of like this mass exodus of uh, what used to be a prominent or predominantly African-American community now becoming uh, more mixed and, you know, less and less African-American. So I guess my comment to you is, is how can we have this conversation uh, leave from this room in Durham and actually come back east with me <laughs> to Kinston, North Carolina, so that we can inform uh, the community at large on uh, the plus or the pros and cons of gentrification, what to look out for, um, how it affects the uh, total community, how it plays into the inclusive piece. The biggest hurdle to start with is how, how to tell your story. You know, I feel like getting that historical perspective um, helps ground it in something that people can wrap their heads around. And then, um, you know, figuring out ways to describe what's happening in your community now. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you about just like methodology stuff. Um, I'd also be happy to connect you to people in Durham who might be much better of a representative than me to go to Lenore and talk to your community about it. Um, but yeah, I feel like figuring out how to tell your story um, historically, currently, and then I feel like it's never too early to, to, to think about like controlling land. It's never too early. Um, I wanted to ask, it's been my experience in Durham for 17 years that uh, um, certainly historic preservation tax credits have been a powerful accelerant of gentrification. I was excited to see or interested in seeing some of your comments on that as well. And yet, strangely, we seem to be having two conversations in Durham. Historic preservation tax credits are great and positive, and we need affordable housing. Um, are there things we should do to affordable tax, or excuse me, uh, uh, historic preservation tax credits either end them or somehow readjust them to help with affordable housing. Um, there's often many of the people who are standing forth and speaking often eloquently right now in Durham about affordable housing. 10 years ago, they were running campaigns for historic preservation in their own neighborhoods that turned those neighborhoods from mixed economic neighborhoods to homogenously upper income, looking primarily at Watts Hill and Dale and Trinity Park here. Um, and now those people are saying, so that having taken the benefits of historic preservation in their own neighborhoods, they're calling for affordable housing in other people's neighborhoods. And this is a conversation that's not being happen in, happening in public right now in Durham. I totally agree. Thank you. <laughs> Getting back to, you know, creating more infrastructure around connecting people to opportunities. Um, I feel like, you know, there could be tremendous things done if low-income people um, were able to do renovations and get historic tax credits back. The two things that are challenging there are the initial access to capital and the fact that they're not making much money so they don't get nearly as much back. Um, it's two conundrums of, of the tax credits. But that said, I feel like there can and should be, within the preservation community and elsewhere, much more conscientious work done to bring historic preservation benefits to long-term low-income households. Um, I'm so interested in that. I don't um, know quite where to start that conversation, but I think it could be an asset to people that it's not currently being an asset to. You're talking about advocating for policies, procedures, basically to, to drive the city towards these affordable uh, housing 
And we have Mayor Bell saying, and I've heard this from other uh, city planning individuals, basically that our structure is neutered in that uh, sense of being able to actually tell landlords and developers like you can do, you know, you must basically in this location have a certain percentage, this is the maximum you can charge for rent. So how do you propose that we actually change that? Because we also have a legislature that would, uh, a state legislature that would never support changes that would allow us to do some of these things that would put in price controls. I think we utilize the primary resource that we have right now, which is publicly owned land. I feel like, in addition to the bus station site, there's a large piece of land called Fayette Place. It's just north of the Heritage Haytai Center. It's been vacant. It used to be public housing ages ago. It's big. It's close to transit. It would be, it has a lot of support from the black church community. Um, it is on the radar. Um, to be purchased by the Durham Housing Authority, it's going to cost them a lot of money, and the city's going to need a lot of community support to make that decision. Um, I feel like there's a couple ways to plug in. Um, I would, I assume most people here on social media, like the Affordable, Co the Affordable Housing Coalition and Transit, like Durham Can. I feel like those two organizations have been largely disseminating the advocacy opportunities. Um, the, the People's Alliance also has been doing a fair amount of that work. Um, so I think what's challenging is it can be overwhelming that there's so much to be done, but if we start identifying these specific opportunities that are very real and fairly imminent, um, it can help us direct sustained community advocacy towards having those properties be affordable. But I mean, overall, what about, you know, changing getting our city council yes that's gonna that's gonna help to a certain extent but you know effectively what can we do to institute these policies as a city basically do it to make durham you should come back to steve Schul's meeting <laughs> i feel like I, I haven't seen anything as amazing or comprehensive um i mean he go he talks about everything from ending homelessness to what needs to be done with Durham Housing Authority properties to bring them up to livability standards, to affordable rentals, extending affordable rental periods, to affordable home ownership. I mean, he really hits the entire comprehensive gamut. And, uh, and I, I wanna figure out how to help him get the word out because I think it's, it's a very powerful agenda. Something else that's happening right now is the city has hired a consultant. They hired a group called the Enterprise Foundation yeah, and something that. that has been lacking in Durham, I think, particularly over the last t 10 to 20 years, is there hasn't been a real guiding philosophy about what our affordable housing strategy should be. And these consultants are really good. One of the pri They live in Durham, which is really good. And I think that they're going to provide a really good roadmap for what we should be doing, what resources we need to be doing what we, what we should be doing, and um, getting consensus and buy-in from our elected officials and our city staff. I know a lot of people in the audience here are involved with some of the nonprofit housing organizations, but if you're not, you should be, if you're interested in this, because it's that community organizing that has been pushing Durham at the forefront of these things for the past 30 years or so. I mean, we're not perfect, but we're better than some. Um, and it's because of that kind of community organizing. Also, we are, we are so lucky to have self-help and all of their various aspects, self-help ventures fund, self-help self CDC and self-help credit union. And if you don't have an account at self-help credit union, put some money there because they give loans for affordable housing projects and, you know, and that's a way of putting your money where your mouth is as, as well as still earning 0.01% interest on your money. <laughs> and I um, also just wanted to mention that the land trust is a model. They, as part of their as part of their board organization, they require that a third of the board members are community land trust mem um, land owners uh, or property owners, so that they do always ensure that there's community input in those decisions that they're making. It's not just some nebulous board of directors making decisions for the other. Thank you.
produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.